So I guess the, the answer is um, if you prefer to work on WCOS, um, go ahead and work on WCOS. If you uh, spend most of your time working on Hera, go ahead and use that. And if you don't have access to either of those, hopefully you'll have access to JET or your own um, compilation um, or you are using uh, the cloud. So, okay, I think that we are going to get started. I just wanted to um, say welcome back, everybody. I hope that the first two weeks have been uh, it, informational and useful. Uh, you know, we're trying to take this at a pace that um, allows people to understand, uh, you know, all the, the options or at least some of the, the um, major options as well as um, asking some questions. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a, a quick overview of where we are right now. Um, we're on December 14th. Uh, we did not get to Gen VX mask. Um, the um, you know the running of that um, or the hands-on for PCP combine. Um, and so uh, we're going to go through that today. And if there's time, we're going to start diving into that plus configuration. If we wind up only having like 10 minutes left in the session, then um, it's possible what we'll do is we'll just open it up for Q&A. Um, and then we have added a session next week. Um, Tina and, and myself will be, um, you know, diving into more fully into MET plus configuration as well as evaluating on um, using grid-based grid analyses. Um, so grid-to-grid -grid verification. We'll be off for the, the holidays. And then when we come back on January 4th, we recognize that, um, you know, that we, we kind of added a session on the 21st. Um, and we're also going to all need to, to dust off cobwebs if you are um, out for the holidays. And so um, we'll pick back up with the refresher of evaluating using, you know, using grid-based analyses, see how far we get into that, and then um, hopefully start diving into um, using point-based observations, um, which will then um, carry over to January 11th, um, and then hopefully dive into um, evaluating ensembles on January 18th. Um, January 25th is the AMS conference. Um, so personally, I will be attending that remotely, um, but we, we do want to um, you know, leave it open for Q&A. So um, some of our team will be available for, for questions um, during that, that week. Um, and then in February, uh, I, I think that um, we're planning on, on starting off with tropical cyclones, but I'm going to actually be putting out a survey to get a sense of after ensembles, what are our top priorities for um, uh, demonstration and, and training so that we're getting to the, the core um, capabilities that people are interested in. And then I just wanted to point out to you that um, you can find the videos and chat history um, on the agenda page. Um, that um, if you need to, to find the data sets for the online tutorials or you need other resource, you have other resource questions, we do have many of of those resources and support um, questions answered um, on the resources and support page um, as part of the training series website. Um, ask your questions in the discussion forum, especially technical ones. I've been receiving technical questions from people and um, to be honest, I do not have the bandwidth to answer them and sometimes I am not the, the best person to be answering them because I'm kind of at a project manager level right now, not, very, not as technical as I'd like to be. So, um, Please send those questions to the discussion forum. And in doing so, what you're doing is you're helping others as well, because others may have the exact same question that you have. And then, um, you know, feel free to answer questions in the discussion forum. Um, if questions are not answered within 24 hours, then our, our team will come in and, and address those questions. And uh, then, you know, the code is here as well. Um, yes. and. Uh, I guess the, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover as far as announcements go. Um, last week, uh, George did a very nice job of showing how to navigate through the DTC um, web pages to, to actually get to this training series in an effort to just kind of expedite the um, the startup of this, I, I just went directly to training series. I just wanted to point out to you what our agenda is for today. Um, so uh, the pre prerequisite was that you should have um, run through the plot data plane hands-on um, if you didn't complete that during the, um, the session last week. 
Um, we just went over the announcements. Um, if you have any um, need to, uh, to um, get some assistance with getting set up, uh, let us know and uh, we'll try and have someone hop out with, um, with you into a, um, into a breakout room to, to try and, and help get that um, set up completed. We're going to be going through Gen VX mask and then running through um, PCP combined and Gen VX mask, the hands-on portion of it. Um, we'll see where we get to. And um, depending on, on um, where we're at, uh, you know, what time we're at, um, George is going to then step into Met Plus configuration and just kind of be working through um, showing you how to use the, the documentation to help you get up and running with Met Plus. So um, with that, uh, I think I'm going to just go ahead and, and have um, Tina um, start presenting. So I'm going to stop presenting right now and hand it over to Tina. Okay, great. Let me share my screen here. All right, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Yes. Actually, my title still says PCP Combine and Gen VX Mask, but um, we talked about um, we talked about PCP Combine uh, last week, um, so we're just kind of going to go straight into Gen VX Mask here. Um, but a quick reminder: uh, PCP Combine is the tool that uh, allows you to add, subtract, compute means of multiple files. So mathematically combine your data. Um, and GenVX Mask is, uh, here's kind of a MET overview. And GenVX Mask is up in the same area as uh, PCP Combine and that you, you use it on um, gridded forecast data. So what is GenVX Mask? Um, it stands for Generate Verification Mask. Um, and it replaces the earlier Gen Poly Mask and Gen Circle Mask tools. So why would you want to use this? Because there are options to uh, filter or um, use polylines inside Met tools like GridStat. So why would you? Why why do we need this tool? And um, the reason is that if you're using a complex polyline, it can be slow. And so if you want to use a mask on multiple files, then you can generate the mask once and you only have to do that processing once and then apply it to multiple um, fields. So as an example, I've got this picture of accumulated precip. And let's say, you know, in this case, we just want to filter out the, the CONUS. And next to it here is a listing of the latitude and longitude points for a, a, a poly region to filter the CONUS. And I, I'm not showing all of them because it's too complex, but this is an example of what that looks like. So if you run this, if you run this input file and this polyline file through GenVX mask, you get something that looks like the picture down here on the bottom of accumulated precipitation. So you can just filter over um, the CONUS. So what it does is it generates a 0, 1 uh, bitmap mask field to define which grid points are included in your statistics. So if you only want statistics over a region, uh, this is the tool you use. And it can be run iteratively to define uh, like a complex masking region. Um, and as I said before, its its usage is to define a mask once prior to running Met Statistics tools, so that um, if if especially if you've got a complex region, you don't have to keep running it with each run or call to GridStat. Um, so it reads gridded data files and it um, writes uh, and also ASCII formatted LATLON files, and then it outputs um, a NetCDF mask file. So how do you use it? Calling it from the command line is you call the tool GenVX mask and then give it an input file and then a mask file and an output file. And those are the three required arguments. So the input file is uh, your model or your observation on whatever grid it's on 
which defines the grid for the mask. And then the mask file defines the region you want to mask out. And there's a, there's different ways to do this, which we'll talk about in the upcoming slides. And then the output file is just the name of the NetCDF file that you want to output. Uh, so then there's some options below in red. Um, so type string, uh, this would be the type of mask you want to generate. And you can see a number of options there, a poly, a box, circle, track, grid. Um, I'm not going to read all of them. Uh, and then some additional options below. So your input field, which is if you want to give an initial value at each grid point instead of zero being the initial value. Uh, your mask field, which is um, the, the name of the field for data masking. And then there's some further options below where you can do more complex things like um, complements or union intersection, and then um, a threshold option. So if you've got like a data mask, you want a threshold by, you know, mask above data above a certain point, you can use that threshold um, option. So uh, as I said two slides ago, there's a ton of different mask types uh, and they take different input mask files. So if you input a latlon file, it would be a listing of latlon points. From that, you can get a polyline, like a poly region, a box, a circle, or a track output file. Uh, if you input a gridded data file, you can get um, a latlon mask, data mask, or a grid mask. Um, you can also input um, a gridded data file or a timestamp, and from there you could get a solar uh, altitude or solar azimuth, which is um, what's being shown in the animation. So you can see how the solar azimuth changes over time. Um, or I'm sorry, the solar altitude. And then you can also uh, input a shape file. So uh, going on to some examples. So uh, first example here in the gray box at the top is the command that we're using. And then uh, I don't know why this one got bold, um, but the uh, latlon points for um, are the kind of the text or the poly file that we're inputting. So in this case, we're calling genvx mask. The input file is this um, warf file. Um, my latlon points text is the mask file, which is being shown off to the left here, and then polymask is our output file. And then type, and then here's two examples of type. So the first is a polyline, and you can see it just draws, you know, basically a, a region between those, those four points that are listed. It connects the dots and results in a square. And then uh, the second type is box with a width of 15. So that's 15 grid points. And so in this case, we got four regions each of them are width of 15 output. So um, further examples of some other commands using the same file is a circle or track. So the top images are showing um, the distance from the latitude and longitude points um, for the circle or the track command. And then once you give it a threshold, like less than or equal to 500, then you get the output masking regions. So the four circles below that are that are down here, um, or the track um, where the width is less than or equal to 250, and you get you know it looks like a it could be a storm track in this case, um, resulting out of it. So uh, here is an example of how to use the timestamp types. So for solar altitude and solar azimuth. Uh, the command here we're using at the top is genvx mask, the same input file as before, but now it's given a timestamp. So that's 2005, uh, August 7th at 12 UTC. And um, we're getting the solar attitude and solar azimuth, and then uh, giving it a threshold at the bottom generates the two masking regions that you see. Uh, for these commands. So that's another option or way that you can get uh, output. And then uh, finally, grid or data file types. So in this case, we're still using that the same input file, um, but there's a, a, a gridded data file 
that we're inputting as our mask file. And then some examples of different types. So um, if you just call the latitude, you get the output latitude. But once you give it a threshold, say in this case, where they're using two, so greater than or equal to 25 and less than or equal to 55, then you get a masking region that's between those two latitudes. Um, on the left is a data mask. So we're using the field uh, pressure and it's called in this case using the, uh, the name and the level string that uh, you were working with uh, for a uh, plot data plane. So the top is the, is the pressure. And then when you give it a threshold at the bottom, you get uh, an output that looks kind of like this. Um, it's, it's a little bit of an interesting shape, but that's another option. So, and then um, uh, there's, uh, I've got a couple of additional examples in here. So of like more complex things that you can do with GenVX mask. Um, and so this would be an example of a storm following, you're following a storm track and uh, we have a complex definition or masking region, but then um, also um, you can use set logic. So if you want combinations of input files, in this case, we have um, land uh, region on the, on the right. So land is one and we've got uh, Hurricane Sandy on the left. With, and if we want not land and Sandy, so using the complement and the intersection from the beginning, then we get this mask track that looks, um, it, it you know shows the storm track, but it omits the region over, um, over the northeast that's over land. So um, that's kind of a quick overview of Gen VX mask, and um, I think that's yeah, and what uh, what you can do with Gen VX mask. So I. Th I think, um, well, I'm not sure what's on the agenda. I think um, next we'll be working working with some of this on um, computers. So I, uh, who's up next, Tara? Uh, I believe it's John HG. Okay. For doing the hands-on. Yes. Good morning, everybody. I'll share my screen. I'm John Halligatway, if you haven't met me before. Um, thanks for coming this morning. So um, from the agenda page, I am going to, oh shoot, I have too many windows open. Okay, so here I am in the agenda. Um, we just completed the presentation about GenVX Mass. Thank you very much, Tina, for going through that. So for the hands-on session uh, for the next uh, 12 to 15 minutes, the goal is to work through the PCB combined and GenVX Mask exercises. So the PCB combined presentation was last week by Tina, and then she finished up with GenVX Mask just now. And hopefully as we work through examples, the functionality would become a little more obvious. So I'm gonna click on the PCP combined link to go to that port, to that place in the, um, in the online tutorial, which is where we're gonna start. And I am first going to read this important notice that, um, and actually let me refresh my page, there you go. If you're returning to this tutorial, you must verify the tutorial setup script. Uh, you, you must source it before running the following instructions. Um, if you're unsure, then navigate to the this page and 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 check in. So so what I'm going to do on my machine, and um, I want to ask Tara, can you tell me is the size of my font big enough to see, or should I increase it anymore? Uh, to me, it looks fine. Okay. Um, I guess if if uh, if people need me to change it, please uh, put it in the chat, and then uh, somebody in the MetPlus team, please tell me what to do. So, okay, I am currently in my MetPlus 4.0.0 underscore tutorial directory. So uh, please go there now on the machine that, on which you're working. And in this directory, you should have this setup script named MetPlus 4.0.0 tutorial setup dot sh. I'm gonna I'm gonna source that, and instead of typing, I'm just gonna copy paste. And I should point out here that I am working on my Mac. So I have Met Plus installed locally on my Mac and I also have Met installed. Um, so I'm not working on AWS, I'm not working on an HPC, I'm working directly on my machine, which I, at least a handful of you are also doing, I believe. So um, I've sourced it, so now I'm ready to go through and run through the PCV combined exercises. 
I'm not going to read all the words on this page, but as I'm talking, um, I encourage you to, to browse the, the text that's written here. This first page is very easy. All we're doing is running PCP combine um, on the command line and noting its use or the usage statement. So this looks awfully messy because I have my font so big. If you make it wider, it looks a little less messy. But basically, there this is this is I think this wins the award for the longest usage statement in in Met um, because PCB Combine has a lot of functionality, and the, the honestly the command line options are can be a little confusing. So you run PCB Combine um, and either in add, subtract, or derive mode or in some mode. And some mode is written here in square brackets to in indicate that it's optional. That's the default functionality of PCB Combine. Um, as we added on these additional options, we didn't want to break its default functionality. So that's that's the reason for that. And then there's lots more details here uh, in the usage statement about how you specify command line arguments uh, for the tool. So let me try to make this a little bit smaller. And I will go on to the next page where we're going to run the sum command. So we're going to start by creating ourselves an output directory in which we will write the output from PCB Combine. So I'm going to actually, any, any of these dark gray boxes, you can copy paste multiple lines from them. So I'm going to mouse over the entire all the contents of this box. On my Mac, I'm going to use Command C to copy it. And then in the window, in my terminal window, I'm going to use Command V to paste it. So all I'm doing here is I'm creating an output directory. And I'm actually uh, changing my uh, location to that to that output directory. I'm CDing into there. So the next command that we're going to do, we're going to start by running a sum option, uh, the sum command. And I mentioned that it's the default command, so you don't technically need to use dash sum. I'd encourage you to do so uh, just so that you you know are so it's crystal clear what the what the tool is doing. So the sum argument or the sum command basically says look in this directory that I've provided on the command line and write this output file that I've specified here and basically search my directory for files that match this timing criteria. And what this timing criteria means is I'm only interested in files, uh, data that has an initialization time of this timestamp, August 7th of 2005. And I'm interested in input accumulation intervals of three hours. And I want to create an output valid time of 12z on that day with an output accumulation of 12 hours. So basically, I'm searching for four records, each with three hours, to sum up to 12. So I'll copy and paste that command and run it. And it says, it tells me exactly what I just said. It says, I'm searching for four files with these accumulation times to sum to a total of 12. Uh, it goes through and, and tells me about the files that match, the files that it's reading, and ultimately it writes this netcf output file. So let me run nc dump minus h on that file and show you that the, the output variable is named apcp for accumulated precipitation underscore 12 to include the accumulation interval, um, and then along with some timing information and metadata. This file follows the convention used to write netcf output uh, by the Met tools. Unfortunately, right now, this NetCF output is not CF compliant, which I meant, mentioned in the previous week. Um, eventually, we'd like to switch our internal NetCF file format to being CF compliant so we can play nicer with other software. If you run NCV on this file, we can take a look at, at what it looks like. There it is. There's data over, and I know that this is the continental United States. With NCV, if you click on the options, you can turn on coastlines. So I'll click on one of these guys, click OK. And there's some uh, really coarse, uh, uh, not that helpful outlines of the United States or, or of, the, of North America that you can see there. I'll go ahead and close that and move on to the next command. We're, we're also running a sum command, but this time we're doing it using observation data. So we're going to search this directory. For one hour, and we're gonna we're gonna write at this NetCF output file. We're looking for uh, one hour inputs that sum up to a total of 12 with the same valid time as we use for the forecast. But this time, we don't care about the in, um, all the data having the same uh, initialization time. So there's this convention for better or for worse um, that we that we tell by which we tell PCB Combine to ignore um, the 
the initialization time of the data, and that's by putting all these zeros here. Um, we probably could come up with a better convention than that, but that's what we have. Um, and that enables us to sum data across multiple observation files. Copy and pasting that into my terminal window. And this time it tells me uh, it's searching for 12 files and it lists out information, details about the ones that it found and that it's reading and wrote our output file. I'll just skip over the NC dump minus H step and just do NC view. And there's our data. Um, notice that the extent of the observation data is less than the extent of the um, of the uh, forecast data. There's you know missing data along the edges here. That's because stage uh, stage two precipitation analyses are based on radar, and uh, anywhere the radar doesn't have good coverage is given a, a bad data value. But that's okay. The, the, we don't need to make the extent of valid data match. Um, when you run this data through the Met tools like GridStat in the coming weeks. We'll only use grid points that have both a valid valid data for both the forecast and the observation. Okay, um, so we ran through those commands um, and actually have already really completed the second step, um, the second page here where we used NC view to, to view the output. So um, you'll notice here we just describe the, the, the idea that we're, we were looking for four input files in the first run and 12 input files in the second run. Um, if you if you're running on Hera, for example, and you want access to NCV in order to visualize the NetCDF files, um, try running module load NCV. Okay, um, so in in earlier versions of this tutorial, this was the only place we mentioned the plot data plane tool. We did already cover it more extensively last week, or or I, th I think last week. Um, so I so you know you're already introduced to it. I just want to demonstrate here that we can run plot data plane on this output. And remember, with, with NetCDF files, we specify the name of the variable, so APCP underscore 12, along with information in the level string about how to index into the dimensions. So um, let me run this nc dump minus h command again. Notice here that this variable that we want to plot is, is indexed by lat and long. So just uh, the, those, and those are just the two. Uh, the two dimensions. So that's why we use the star comma star because that's those are the two gridded dimensions for which we want to plot the data. I'll copy and paste this command. And that creates this postscript output file. Let me also demonstrate that if you run this, if you increase the verbosity level, which basically is the logging level from the default value of two to something like four, you'll see a lot more information. Um, you'll see information about the uh, the the grid on which the data lives, timing information. Um, so it so if you if you're looking for more details, try rerunning the same command using a higher verbosity level. I'm going to use GV or actually GV doesn't work on my Mac, but fortunately, if I just run open on my Mac, it will it knows what to do with PostScript files. So I'll run that, um, make this a little bit smaller. So that's you know much nicer display with the. Um, with the map outlines, and that's our forecast data overlaid. Looks good to me. Okay, another another thing to note about uh, you know the plot data plane tool. Those these postscript postscript files can be a little bit pesky. I need the right viewer to display them. So if you have the convert command available on your machine, you can run this command to convert it from postscript to PNG. Um, use this dash rotate 90 option to get the results uh, oriented well. Uh, unfortunately, on my machine, I do not have the convert command. If I run which convert, it doesn't find it. So I can't demonstrate this one, but that's OK. Um, let me move on to the add and subtract functionality of, of PCP combined. And I'm going to I'm going to make this window a little bit wider. Um, at the end of each line, you see this backslash. That's a line continuation marker. And all that means is that this is one long command line that's that's written across multiple lines. So um, if if you, the window is narrow, things wrap and don't look as good. If you make your your window wider, um, the commands look a little bit uh, look a little bit better. Although on this next one, it looks like there's still wrapping occurring, but that's okay. So with the PCB combined add function, instead of listing directories that you search for data, you explicitly list file names. So here. Um, I've said add, and I've said here is my first file name, 
And after the file name, I listed uh, this number 03. So by default, PCP combined search for records of accumulated precipitation, APCP, um, because MET was originally created with GRIB1 and GRIB2 inputs in mind. And so that's our that's kind of our default convention to search for that data. So when you just see a number there, that means precipitation with that accumulation involved. So then we'll search this next file for 03 data for three hour precip. Basically, we list all four of them explicitly. So if I run this command and write the output file, which is the last argument here, um, you'll notice that the result, if I run uh, use NCV to display it, it's exactly the same as what we got from the sum command. So really, um, it's up to you whether the sum or add command makes is more makes more intuitive sense to you. I believe that both of them are supported in the um, PCB combined wrapper, uh, Met Plus wrapper, um, which and we're going to learn more about the Met Plus wrappers and that later the, later day, today, hopefully, and also in coming weeks. Here's another example of running the add command. You'll see that this time, instead of specifying just a number 03, I'm specifying a little configuration string. So notice that my configuration string begins with a single quote and ends with a single quote, which tells the, the Linux command line that this should be processed as one long string. So instead of, you know, by default, getting three hour accumulated precipitation from the data file, instead we'll get whatever data you have specified here. So this is like a little miniature configuration file, just like we saw last week from the plot data plane tool. So we're looking for UGRD, which is U component of wind at 10 meters, VGRD, the V component of wind at 10 meters. We're, we're reading it from the same input file. We're going to add them together and write output. Now, why in the world would you want to add together U and V for 10 meters? I don't think you ever would. Um, this is just to demonstrate the functionality. And this is what happens when scientists tell engineers to come up with an example. It's a valid example, but it doesn't uh, do much, doesn't make much sense scientifically. Also notice here, I added this command line option dash name, UGRD plus VGRD. If you run nc dump minus h on this output, you'll see that um, you'll see that now instead of uh, letting PCB combine choose the output name, we use whatever you specify on the command line. So that's that's a good option to know about. Subtract is uh, very similar. You could run the same command, but instead of adding those wins, you could subtract them. So I'm going to copy and paste this. This is what you get from subtracting them. I don't know if that's meaningful or not, likely not. Um, moving on, we could run the plot data plane tool. This time we're getting a little bit fancier. We'll plot that, that image that I just showed using plot data plane. Um, we're going to specify, so basically you, this is the input file, NetCF file, the output PostScript file that we're going to create. This is the data we want to read from that input file. So that variable name and then star comma star. Now I'm telling it to explicitly set the plot range. Since I know this is going to be positive and negative values, I want to make the plot range symmetric instead of just scaling to the um, range of valid data. I'm going to give it a title. And this time I'm going to explicitly specify the color table I want to use. I know and these color tables are bundled with the MET code, and you, you're welcome to use any of them. Um, I picked this positive negative one so it can easily show um, which values are greater than zero, which values are less than zero. I'm going to open the results. And if you're um, following along, you can run hopefully GV or ghost view to display it. So here, um, the, the, the warm colors are greater than zero. The blue colors are less than zero. So just more examples of, of how to use these tools. Okay. I think this is the last one, the last example for PCB combined. And this, in this one, instead of doing add, subtract, or sum, we're going to use the derive option. So there's multiple things uh, that, that can be derived from this input data. Notice here um, that I've specified min, max, mean, and standard deviation. Um, so basically, I want to read a bunch of data and at each grid point compute these values. And notice also that I am, the input files are specified in a slightly different way this time. I'm explicitly listing uh, multiple files here. Notice that I put a star there. So basically this will, this will get expanded out to four or five or six or however many files actually live in that directory. And I'm using the dash field option to say I'm interested in, in deriving these things for both the U component of win and the V component of win. I'm going to write this in SDF output file. 
Now, um, this ver these variations of how we specify the command line options are also supported by the add option. Um, and if you read the usage statement very carefully, um, then you'll you'll see a description of of, of how all this works. Um, but unfortunately, that's why the usage statement is too is so long because there's a lot of variations that are that are supported. I will copy and paste this command and run it. I'll run nc dump minus h on the result. And you can see now, rather than having a single variable, we have many. So we have the lat long, we have 10 meter wind minimum value, maximum value, average, uh, standard deviation, and the same for the V component of wind. You run nc view on that file. You see now that instead of having one variable to plot that we, that we can visualize, we have many. Here is the minimum uh, U component of wind and the maximum U component of wind, for example. I'll switch back and forth between the minimum and the maximum. You see the pattern changes. So um, that this is the end of the, the um, PCB combine uh, instructions or, or exercises. I want to check in with Tara first before proceeding to see if uh, should I just go ahead and proceed to the, the gen VX mask examples now? Or yeah. should we break, should we, do you want to break for any questions or just plow ahead? Uh, so I'm not seeing any questions in chat that have not been addressed. Uh, I guess we could take one question if someone wants to come off mute and, and ask a question. Okay, so there's one that just came into chat. Um, can we use PCB combined to perform more complex operations such as computing wind speed or direction? Uh, no, that, that's not currently supported in PCB combined. I, although computing wind speed and direction is something that is you know, often done. Um, so right now the um, PCB combined just processes each field independently. It doesn't combine multiple fields. Um, there is Python support for Python embedding in MET, um, where uh, you you can compute that in your own Python script. Or there's actually something else I should mention. If if you're dealing with GRIB data, um, you and you request wind. So let me let me type on the command line here. Um, the you know if you UGRD is the abbreviate is is a common abbreviation for the U component of wind. VGRD is common one for V component. Wind is a common one for wind speed. If you request, there is special logic in MET. So if you request wind speed data and it doesn't actually exist in your file, MET will automatically go search for the U, the corresponding U and V components and automatically derive wind speed for you on the fly. Um, and in earlier versions of MET that was only supported for GRIB1 and GRIB2, um, I believe you know, either either we have already supported it for net CDF data, or we are we have a GitHub issue defined to do so. I can't remember the status of that. Same is true of wind direction. Are there or can there be any GRIB one or GRIB two files in the MET DAT data tree? Jack, I'm not sure what the MET DAT data tree. What you refer to by that? Yeah, John, I'm looking. I'm trying to see if I can see an example in the. It's the met plus underscore data tree. Oh, you, yeah. Okay. The sure. message, yeah, so I was curious. Yeah. You know, those files we were just using are um, our grib, even though they didn't have a grib suffix. Um, let's look for, let's search in met plus data. Or anything any with grib. There are some files. So um, if I run wgrib on this, so this has u and it also has v, but it does not have wind speed. So um, or should I show an example of this in action or should we move on to GenVX mass? What are your, what, what's your preference here? Um, I, I think that we should move on to GenVX mask. Fair enough. Okay. So yeah, if you were just, for example, if if you were to just plot data from this file and specify that you want wind at 10 meters, it would go get the U and V and derive wind for you. 
Okay, um, let me go on to the exercises here. So now we're going to move on to the Gen VX mask. Um, and this is thanks to Julie Prostopnik. She and I worked. She and I worked together late last week to add additional examples uh, for Gen VX mask. So again, if you if you if you are just coming back to this and starting, uh, we begin with this reminder that you need to source your environment your Met Plus tutorial setup environment before running this command. Um, so I've already done that in this window. And reminder, if you know if you open up multiple windows, you need to source it in each window that you open. So I'll run Gen VX mess in the command line. This one also has a, a lengthy uh, usage statement, not quite as long as PCB combined, but um, lots of options here. Um, let's move on to the run polytype. So um, just like we did with PCB combined, I'm going to copy and paste these commands to create an output directory for Gen VX mask, and I'm going to CD into that output directory. The first example here is the example that Tina showed in her presentation, where we're reading um, data. We're basically when you run Gen VX mask, you have an, uh, two two important arguments, which is the input file is the first one, the mask file is the second one, and then the output file that you want to create is the third one. So in this case, where the input file defines the grid for which we want to mask and in this case, we're defining that grid um, by, by saying, here's a grid of data file. Use whatever grid that data lives on. So we pass in that grid of data file. We pass in this PyLine file. And we want to write that Nessia output file. And here we're specifying that we want to do polyline masking. So I'll copy and paste that command and run it. It ran very quickly. You'll note that uh, you know this, this grid is only 185 by 129. So it's a very coarse grid. Even though the CONUS mask has 243 points in it, it run, ran almost instantaneously. If you run NC view on the result, CONUS mask, you'll see the result here. OK, um, let me go on to the lat lawn masking type, because I think um, I think this is this is important. Um, in, instead of after each run, having a command to copy and paste to run nc dump minus h or nc view or plot data plane, we begin here just with a note that says, after each time you run, after each run of these command of the genvix mask command, consider running the you know looking at the output using nc dump minus h, nc view or plot data plane. Um, so to avoid repeating that, um, so here we are moving on to the dash type lat option. So <clears throat> I also want to point out that um, that there's multiple ways you can specify the input grid. Um, you can give the path to grid a data file, which is what we did the first time. This time, we're using a string that is the name of a predefined grid. And if you follow this link, this will take you to uh, the list of predefined grids that EMC has. And these are all predefined in the MET code, or the vast majority of them. Um, so for, for latitude masking, we say this is the grid. And we really don't need anything else. We really just need a placeholder for the second option, for the second command or um, command line option. So we just list the same thing twice. We're going to create an output file named GOO4 underscore tropics because we're saying for that grid, just consider the latitude of each grid point and define a th and threshold them. And so this threshold is greater than or equal to negative 30 and less than or equal to 30. So basically, we're defining the tropics as being latitudes between negative 30 and 30. Copy and paste that. And let's NC view the result. And there's grid 4 is a global grid. And here is all the, the grid points shown in red are between negative 30 and 30. Running NC dump minus H on that. Um, let's see, NC dump minus H. Um, which we've done here, you see that the name of the the mask was chosen by uh, GenVX mask. This is called lat mask, and it gives you know the the attributes list how it was how it was created, what threshold was applied. Um, in this next command, instead of letting GenVX mask pick, we're going to use the name option to define um, to define the output name. In this case, in this next op next command, we're going to name it East Pack. So what we're doing here now, Tina mentioned that you can run GenVX mask iteratively, and that's what we're doing here. So we're saying read in the mask we just created as the input. Um, and this, type we're, this time we're going to do lawn masking. 
And just like when we did last ma la lap masking, latitude masking, we repeated the same thing twice. We're going to do that here. And then now our output file is going to be named Eastpac. Um, notice here that we are saying for each grid point, we want to threshold the longitudes between negative 70 and negative 130. So throughout MET, uh, degrees west is negative and degrees east is positive. And with these two masks, the one we read as input and the one we just defined, we are going to compute the intersection. So let's see what that looks like. And we'll run NCV on the result. And now we have this box because we took the intersection of our latitude band with our longitude band. If we rerun that same command, but instead of taking the intersection, we take the union, we should now get a, a cross shape. So there we go. It looks like the flag of some country. I'm not, I can't remember which one though. Okay, um, next I wanna demonstrate the grid type masking. So again, um, we're, we're starting with grid 004, so it's our named, uh, named grid. And this time we are saying, read whatever grid uh, this data lives on, the stage two data we used in PCB combined commands, and only, only, extract, only uh, use the grid points of our input grid that also live within the bounds of this grid, and write that in SEF output file. The result is uh, grid 004 subgrid looks like that. So basically, this is the portion of the global grid that lives inside this smaller grid. And that concludes it for this one. The next, the next page has examples of data and solar masking. Um, so here, um, when the type is data, this is our input grid. And the second, uh, the second option, the mask file, is the data is the file from which we want to read data. Um, basically, we from the mask file we read the mask field. So this is saying, for the grid that this data lives on, extract data from this file, the mask file. In this case, we're extracting data named land L0, which is basically a land C mask, and then apply a threshold to that. So here, we're, we're interested in grid points where the land field has a value equal to one. And whichever those grid points are, we're going to name the resulting variable land. That, that one ran pretty quick because this is a, you know, such a coarse grid, 360 by 181. And here's the result. So it's uh, red. Everywhere it's red is a value of one. So you can see this land sea mask includes both the um, ocean and inland lakes. Next, if we wanted a land mask, one thing we could do would be to rerun the exact same command, except this time um, to, you apply the dash complement option to do basically reverse video of that. And CV the result, and you see now we have switched it. Um, it's one anywhere uh, we've, we've taken the complement of the previous mask. So that's one way that you could get a water mask. There's actually another way, and that's just by changing the threshold. So instead of taking the complement, and instead of thresholding equal to one, we could just say threshold equal to zero. And that would be all the water points. Copy and paste that. And you can see the result here. Same thing. Um, and next we have an example of applying the solar altitude type masking. This, is, uh, this was developed several years ago for our work with um, renewable, renewable energy. Um, we were interested in the grid points at which, uh, that were, at which, day, um, at which the sun was shining. So um, for grid four, we say for, for this timestamp, give me all the, compute the solar altitude, and those for, with those values, I want to threshold them greater than zero. So basically, the altitude, solar altitude greater than zero means that the sun is shining at that grid point, or at least the sun is above the horizon. So you can see that nice shape. Um, next, let's demonstrate what happens where we take that uh, the land mask we generated previously, and we intersect it with this solar altitude mask. 
So this is combining two masks. Now you see uh, the result is all the grid points that are over land at which the sun is above the horizon. And um, boy, we got a lot of examples here. Uh, I think this is the last page. And it looks like we're running very short on time. Um, so I think Perry Shafron was right. We were too ambitious in the amount that we wanted to cover. So what we're going to do here is we're going to read data. We're, we're going to create a polyline file on the fly. And the way we're going to create this is by extracting data from a best track file, a hurricane best track file. So I'm going to start by just echoing this string, this Dorian string, to the, uh, an output file that I've named Dorian.poly. And then I'm going to run this fancy uh, cat and awk uh, unique command to extract out the lat lawn values from a best track file for Hurricane Dorian and format them uh, as numerically for use by Met. So copy and paste that command. Don't worry about understanding all these awk uh, and unique options. I'll just cat the results so you can see what it looks like. You can see basically it begins, the, the polyline in Met begins with a string to name it and then a bunch of lat lawn points afterwards to define the location of the, 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 the latitudes and longitudes of interest. So here, demonstrating dash track type, ma the, the track type masking, we say for the grid, predefined grid number three, which also is a global grid, read in this polyline file. Actually, I'm gonna copy and paste this because this takes a minute to run. So read in this polyline file and write out a Dorian track file. Basically, at, for each grid point, we're computing the minimum distance to this uh, to this storm track. And we're going to threshold those distances as being less than or equal to 200. So um, here is a result. I'll zoom in, click the mag magnification button to zoom in. And you can see here, and actually I'm going to sometimes NC view tries to be fancy and it doesn't make the plot look good. But these are all the grid points that are within 200 kilometers of that defined track. Next, to demonstrate the circle type masking, I'm just going to pick off the first two lines of that file. So I'm doing head minus two of that polyline file and writing it out to a new file named Dorian first.poly. You can see this uh, output file now only has a single lap. It has a name, but it also has a single point in it. And all we're going to do here is um, run that same command, but using this Dorian first poly, using circle type masking. And this time we're interested in less than or equal to 500 kilometers. And the result is this one circle. So this could be useful. Uh, if you have multiple points, you basically get a circle around each one. This could be useful if you have radar locations and are interested in verifying the grid points that are within a certain distance of that radar location. Um, in, in all these, in several of these examples, I've used the thresh option. And what we're asking here is, um, what do you get if you omit that option, the threshold option? You'll notice if you rerun the command without it, you'll get this warning message that says, when implying the circle mask, since we you didn't specify a threshold, we'll just write the minimum distance to each grid point, or from, from each grid point to that, to, that, um, to that location. Run NCV on that, and you'll see this is where a point was, and the, the, the value at each grid point is the, minimum, is the distance to that point. Um, that was how we created one of the slides that Tina projected for the solar altitude masks. Um, that, so basically, if you omit the threshold option from, for track masking, data masking, solar altitude, solar azimuth, masking types, um, then you'll just get the raw value or the derived value instead of that, that has not been thresholded. But you'll also see that warning message. That may or may not be useful to you in um, your use of MET and MET+. Plus. So Tara, I'm going to hand it back to you. Um, we are at 9.56, so I've gone wildly over. Yeah, well, we have some questions. Um, the first one is related to um, fill values, underscore fill values, and is there a way to specify fill values? Um, it's Catherine. 
is there so um there is not right now um let's look at one of the files we created you'll notice that the fill value so the 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 bad data value the met uses negative 9999 as the bad data value and there is not an easy way to change that however if you are passing to met a net cdf file that has an attribute with a different fill value that's fine when we read data from files we look at how the fill value is defined and we when we read that into memory the code converts any ins any instances of that fill value to the the internal bad data value of negative 9999 okay um, from Ben Cash, is there a catalog of mask definitions available? So um, the ones, you, okay, Ben, do you mean examples like the different types or a lot of, you know, like many polylines? Is that, what are you, what, what can you clarify a little bit? Uh, I was just thinking of things like specifying conus, uh, you know, just, I don't know how I would necessarily go about building some of these more complicated looking masks uh, myself. So I was wondering uh, how many of these have been done and if they're publicly available. Yeah, that, okay, that's a great question. Um, you know, honestly, for the complicated looking ones, I would uh, recommend using shape files. And we have, we did not cover shape files in this example, in this tutorial. Um, so if you go to, if you search for natural earth, there are some natural shape files. There are some publicly freely available um, shape files for the outlines of countries, um, it, physical and cultural boundaries. So um, I would use the, you know, if you need an outline of the state of Montana, for example, that's how I would do it. I'd go get the shape file, figure out which record uh, contains Montana and, and do it that way. Um, there are included, so let me go to, um, there are a handful of polylines included in, um, in the MET release. Oh, I think I've, where, where should I go here? So I want to go, um, MET share, let's see. In the MET release, oh, share MET. Okay. There is a, so, so, wherever met is installed there is a share directory share slash met and in there um, there is a directory named poly and you'll see that there are several files in here that have a poly suffix and so um let me go into go in there and open it up um there's a there's a nsep vx regions.pdf so these were this, these are outlines of um the regions that uh, that EMC has used for verification in the past, that basically over North America, um, they're they're currently developing some new regions. But you know these these are the regions on which a lot of verification results have been reported. So these are available in Met, um, and then in the Met Plus use cases, if there is a specific um, polyline or verification region used. You can find examples of that, but we'll see more. We'll see more about the Met Plus use cases in the coming weeks. Okay, so we're at the top of the hour. There are still some other questions in the chat that um, you know we'll we'll go through and pull out and either um, put into um, discussion so that the questions are you know the answers are readily available to the entire group um, or you know address something directly. There's some questions that are, are more specific to a, um, a particular setup. So um, thank you very much, John and Tina, and actually to all the participants. Uh, we will be back here next Tuesday, 9 a.m. Uh, Mountain Time, 1600 UTC. Thank you. <laughs>